All right, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do here at the University of Maryland. Uh, my name is Susan Muller. I'm a professor here. Um, came about three years ago, right before September 11th, and it's been an interesting time to be here. Okay, and uh, I'm not going to actually be including my question, and so uh, just so. Uh, oh, you want this actually like, for the. Well, for the yeah, trade? just for, you know, when you say here, uh, instead of saying here, University of Maryland. So I may, I may stop you occasionally to, to repeat it. Sure, um, that's fine. So. Go ahead and just do that again. Okay. Um, my name is Susan Muller. I'm a professor here at the University of Maryland. Been here since September 2001, um, more or less since the 9-11 uh, bombings um, and plane crashes. And it's been an interesting time to be here. And can you talk a little bit about your study and the genesis of, of why you looked at um, the, some of these time periods leading up to the war and before and after? Yeah. My background is in media and international affairs. and. So I'm particularly interested in how the media covers international crises. And there was a consortium of groups that was interested particularly in how the media, both print and broadcast, were covering weapons of mass destruction, or WMD. And uh, so they came to me and th asked whether I could figure out more than in an anecdotal way whether the coverage had been as bad, actually, as they thought it was. Uh, they thought there was some real, not only lack of balance in the coverage, uh, political balance, but because a lot of these uh, people who are coming to me were public policy folks and scientists, they were concerned that there was a, a conflation of what actually constituted weapons of mass destruction and that some of the science of it wasn't being correctly represented. And they also thought that perhaps there were stories that were very grossly overcovered and stories that were undercovered. And uh, what did you see was kind of dictating what the media was, was covering and not covering? Well, there's a, there's a couple of, I think, sort of background elements to the coverage. One is just how the media covers international affairs in general. Um, and, you know, the cute answer is they cover them poorly. Um, usually international affairs is covered uh, as sort of a big story coverage. There's a lot of attention put on maybe one, maybe two issues, and that's about, and that's about it. Uh, and that, that big story gets a lot of attention, but mostly in, in a breaking news way. Uh, there tends not to be a lot of depth or breadth or context. It's more what's happening right now. And usually that big story, whatever it may be, takes all the oxygen and it uses up all the oxygen in, in, the, in the newsroom. Um, and so there's not a lot of coverage of a lot of countries in the world. You know. We talk in, in my class about something called the news net, which is if you put you know, little flags in a globe around the world, uh, those flags representing uh, the countries where uh, the news media uh, covered, you'd see that the net was not well distributed. Um, there would be a lot of little flags in the Middle East, for example, or in Western Europe, but much of Africa, South America, and lots of Asia would wouldn't have no flags at all. So uh, part of the coverage of WMD had to do with just how does the media cover international affairs in general. And it usually only covers international affairs when there's a crisis. Um, and then it's responding to the crisis and usually not um, responding from a, from a breadth of, of knowledge. Uh, the other element is that uh, WMD crosses a lot of what we call in the, new, in, the, in the journalism business, we call beats. So a, a beat is like you're covering the State Department or you're covering the White House, you're covering health care or education. Uh, weapons of mass destruction not only would be a White House beat or a Pentagon beat or a State Department beat, but would also be a science and technology beat, would also be an intelligence and national security beat. And uh, there aren't a lot of reporters, either in print or broadcast, who have a Rolodex that includes people from all of those different categories. They tend to know their own turf very well, but not be able to, to, to move well amongst all of those. Um, and so that was a problem, was that you would have uh, reporters who would be covering the politics of a WMD crisis, but couldn't tell you about the science of it. And so what that meant was that just in general, um, there was a lot of stenographic reporting of what they heard, um, of what politicians were saying in Senate testimony, for example. And so 
when you have this kind of political conflation of WMD, can you make distinctions that should have been made um, between chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons? Yeah, there was often in the coverage, and again, I'm, I'm using coverage kind of writ broadly, and uh, the media is not monolithic, and there were some media outlets that did a better job than others. But <clears throat> generally, there in the coverage uh, writ broadly, there was a, a conflation among uh, chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. And not only amongst those, but among um, civilian programs and military programs, civilian programs being for power, um, you know, energy to run your home. Um, and there were not sufficient distinctions made in the reportage, for example, in a place like Iraq, or, or Iran, rather. Um, for example, in the coverage, there was not a lot of distinction made in a place like Iran between uh, civilian nuclear efforts uh, and potential uh, military uh, nuclear uh, programs. Uh, so that was one problem. Another problem was a uh, problem of not making distinctions among the chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. And within those three categories, of not making distinctions in kind of size or risk, for example, in uh, uh, in any of those three categories, you can talk about battlefield weapons, which are perhaps a potential risk to a fairly small group of people, um, a horrible risk, but a potential risk of people uh, in, in a very discreet area, in, in a battlefield, for example, versus a weapon that has capability to, to move beyond its immediate vicinity into a larger, into a larger realm. Um, and often uh, what we saw in the WMB, <laughs> and often what we saw in the WMD discussion was this sort of a tendency to go towards the ap apocalyptic, a tendency to talk about uh, WMD as if they were always um, Dr. Strange Lovian, you know, threatening the world, or certainly threatening the United States. And to what degree, um, it seems like a legitimate thing within the uh, journalism has no idea of the extent of the threat. Or do they? Do they have a? Should they make distinctions of the, the actual chances of being passed to terrorists? I think you mentioned that some in your, your study would the the actual chance of WMD being passed to terrorists to be delivered. Yeah, another I, I think problem in in the coverage, uh, again just in general about WMD, and this is particularly post 9/11, was the conflation between. Uh, talking about terrorism and talking about uh, one of the problems uh, post 9-11 in the coverage of WMD was a conflation uh, between acts of terrorism and acquisition or use of WMD. They were talked about as if they were the same, same thing, although you know, to date there, have not, there has not been a terrorist act that has, uses, that has used but to date, there has not been a terrorist act that has used weapons of mass destruction um, that have been truly mass um, destruction. I mean, we've, the only occasion, perhaps, is the um, Sarin episode on the Japanese subways. And I guess the people on the right, if they would hear that, they say just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean that it will. Well, sure. Uh, there is the risk that terrorists, or you know, people also talk about rogue states getting getting hold of um, chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, and the threat that that poses. But what I'm talking about is in a in a news story, uh, the need to make it clear uh, that uh, the highest risk is actually not the most likely risk. Uh, if you talk to the scientific community, and, and I'm not a scientist, but if you talk to the scientific community, most of them will talk about the real threats being things like biosecurity or fissile controls or, you know, what's going on with nuclear controls in Russia and so forth. They're not talking about al-Qaeda. Uh, they're not talking about Hamas. Is, uh, and, and so do you see a, uh, the agenda being set by the, the White House then, or? with the, the journalists uh, and what they're covering? Well, what was very interesting in the study that I did on, uh, on 
the media coverage of WMD was that it was not just a study of Iraq, it was a study of three time periods, uh, 1998, uh, 2002, and 2003, and that gave us both the Clinton and Bush administrations and gave us three different regions of the world that were in crisis because of WMD, um, South Asia, India, and Pakistan and their nuclear tests in 98, North Korea in the fall of 2002, and then preeminently Iraq in the spring of 2003. And what we saw was pre-9-11, so back in 1998, the media made very clear distinctions uh, between uh, rogue states or terrorists using um, their own various methods to capture attention and weapons of mass destruction. They were not seen as the same. Uh, occasionally there was a list of potential threats and terrorism uh, was distinguished uh, from use of, of weapons of mass destruction, either chemical, biological, or, or nuclear. When you move to uh, the 9-11 period and after, you're of course now in the Bush administration. Um, and one of the things that um, comes out very clearly uh, post 9-11 was how the media were queuing off the president's uh, assessment of, of risk. Uh, the president would come out in a speech and say, you know, Saddam Hussein has, he would say in effect, weapons of mass destruction. We need to fear these. This is a risk not only in the theater, but it's a risk to us as Americans. And the reporters would report those speeches, uh, and they would lead with the president's assessment of the risk. Uh, and very rarely uh, would there be um, as prominently any kind of caveats about that. Uh, interestingly, at the same time frame, there were caveats expressed about North Korea. Uh, in 2002, for example, in the fall of 2002, in the buildup to the war in Iraq, the president was making his case for why the United States needed to go to war. At the same time, we're having this, um, this, this crisis with North Korea about their coming clean with their nuclear program. And the media, as it reported on North Korea, was very careful to talk about shaky intelligence and what we know and what we don't know. And the president would make a statement, and they would be very um, conscientious about uh, how they would represent what the, president's, the president was saying. But when it came to Iraq, uh, they lost that, that journalistic distance, and they reported stenographically. Okay. Just, uh, sorry. No, sorry. Um, and so when you look at the total time period, um, build up starting like, like maybe back in August of 2002 up until March mm -hmm. of 2003, how would you evaluate the performance of the print? television media during that time period? I think from August to March, uh, I think from August 2002, uh, when we first started getting the arguments from the president, to March 2003, the media coverage was really, uh, particularly reported from Washington, was very poor. Uh, what we tended to get was very stenographic coverage by both the print and the broadcast media. Uh, we had very few alternative sources uh, that we heard from, uh, very few alternative voices, uh, and certainly the ones we did were not mentioned prominently. Uh, there were relatively few articles or stories that challenged the president's statements, uh, and those that did tended to be, uh, particularly in the newspapers, tended to be buried, you know, back on page A13 under the lingerie ads or something like that. Uh, so the impression that was given during that whole point was Saddam is a threat, uh, Saddam harbors terrorists, uh, Saddam uh, has weapons of mass destruction, uh, we need to fear Saddam. And that sort of master narrative, uh, which was disseminated by Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and others, uh, was, was swallowed and swallowed pretty whole. Uh, as I said before, there were some exceptions. There were a few reporters, uh, sort of lone voices crying in the wilderness. Um, a couple of people at the Washington Post, for example, Dana Milbank, um, preeminent among them, a few at Knight Ritter, 
um, Jonathan Landay, Warren Strobel, and others. Um, but for the most part, um, even at the, the sort of prominent uh, news outlets, uh, they really drop the ball. And what do you attribute that to? Why, you know, what is it? You know, what are some of the factors that cause the media to drop the ball? I, I think one of the reasons why the media did so poorly uh, in covering. Sorry, what do you use? Um, I think one of the reasons the media did so poorly in, in critically covering the WMD uh, issue was that they were still on this sort of patriotic bounce off of 9-11. There still was a sense that you don't challenge the emperor for having no clothes. You know, you just go along with it. Um, and then, to be fair, um, it wasn't so clear that the emperor didn't have any clothes. Um, I mean, the intelligent, covering intelligence is very difficult. Um, I mean, this you know, clearly was uh, an intelligence story. It's hard to get people not only on the record, but hard to get people at all outside the administration who, who knew much about it. But there were people who did. Um, there were sources who could have been gone to, preeminent among them, um, the military in the, in the theater. Uh, there also uh, were scientists and others who could have evaluated some of the details that were coming down, uh, whether it was the aluminum tubes or the yellow cake or whatever it might have been. Uh, there were other people who could have been talked to. So part of it was uh, just going to the usual sources, just listening to uh, the White House preeminently. Uh, part of it was uh, covering it as a political story and not as a... Um, an, an, Part of it was covering it as an, a political story and not covering it as a science or technology story or even a military story. Uh, and when they covered it as a political story, uh, they bought into the president's line. The president was still riding high on his popularity. Uh, I guess those are the main reasons. And when you look at the role of Congress, how do you kind of evaluate the role of Congress and since they, you know, the, during the... Yeah. I think another problem that the media had was the media likes one of the problems the media ha one of the problems the U.S. media has is that it likes to cover stories that are controversial through a sort of he said she said kind of coverage, uh, and one of the problems in covering the weapons of mass destruction debate was there were not. Uh, in this sort of August 2002 to March 2003 period, there were not a lot of prominent dissenting voices. There weren't the Democrats in Congress who were speaking up and saying, you know, what's going on here? Uh, or should we challenge this? Or maybe we should be listening to Hans Blix. Uh, or, you know, maybe we should be talking to a wider range of people. So without those sort of go-to uh, folks in Congress, the media didn't really have that um, that classic alternative voice that it's used to. It was a problem for print, but it was particularly a problem for broadcast, uh, which doesn't typically have the kind of deadlines or resources or time to put into a story that print does. And so the kind of you know, easy back and forth that it gets from the White House to Congress just really wasn't, wasn't there. Now, there were lone voices in Congress, but you know, was it that there wasn't enough of a critical mass um, after the congressional vote? Yeah, there really, there, in Congress there were some lone voices. Robert Byrd, for example, of West Virginia, um, you know, gave a ringing speech, for example, on the floor. Uh, there are a few others uh, who were sort of the lone voices crying in the wilderness. But there never was that, that critical mass uh, of, op or of opposition or even questioning of, of the president's uh, stance. And even within the editorial boards uh, or within the sort of the producers in the news outlets themselves, there wasn't this sense that, oh, the president's wrong. Uh, people accepted the fact that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. They accepted that as an argument. Uh, they did not challenge, challenge those assumptions. I mean, one of the key problems was even when later on, towards the spring, starting in January and February and then accelerating in March, when the media did begin to challenge the president's uh, assumptions, they did begin to challenge the spin coming from the White House. Uh, they were looking more critically at, at uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell's presentation before the UN and so on. There was, 
still not a I can hear it. Okay. It's off. Can you hear it still? Oh, is it? Okay. Um, so that's just the white noise. Uh, beginning in, in January, February, March 2003, when the, the media began to you know, challenge the spin and challenge some of the president's assumptions, what they never really did was challenge the way the president set up the news budget. Well, that's not right. Um, it's not the news budget. Um, what's that? Yeah, I was talking about sort of that they were challenging the, um, even when they challenged the spin, they didn't challenge the, 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 well, it's sort of the hierarchy of what's important that the president's ad ad agenda, sort of what he, what he put on as priorities. the priorities. Um, I guess what, you, starting, in the, starting in the spring of 2002, uh, Starting in the spring of, starting in the, in the spring of 2003, in January, February, March of 2003, when the the press began to question the president's assumptions, began to look hard at the spin coming from the White House, uh, you you still never had the media taking a hard look at what the president was putting on the agenda. You know, why are we looking at Iraq? Uh, why is Iraq on the uh, on the agenda in terms of terrorism, in terms of WMD? You know, should there be other countries that are on there? Um, that was a problem. Okay. Um, it's not really what I wanted to say. What's the? How did I put it in here? Go ahead. What's um, the question you want to ask? The um, <sighs> when you look at you know some of the other causes, uh, you talk about sort of the economics of it. Uh, was, you know, when I hear uh, Bill Plant talk to uh, Martha John Kumar, he's saying that you know, there's not a lot of researchers that are left in news organizations. And so do you send a, see a tendency to only cover events and when you have these issues that are over, over time that you, you kind of just, uh, you know, the big questions of why are we even going into Iraq? Um, so talk about maybe some of the, the other you know, oh, problems with the news media, just in general. Okay. Uh, yeah, still looking for this. Somewhere I stated brilliantly. Um, all right. Well, I'll come up with it in a sec. Does this does this reflect white on me indifferently? That I should put it down. No, we, didn't, we can't see it. Now. You can keep it in your mouth. You sure it's not reflecting white up? No. Okay. a draft. I couldn't find my hard copy. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Ah, oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so when do you finish this thought, here since you're mine? <laughs> yeah. Um, still not exactly right. Um, Starting in 2003, in January, February, March 2003, when the media were beginning to challenge the spin coming from the White House, uh, they still never really challenged the president's prioritization of events, uh, how the president framed, uh, framed the news, how he framed uh, the stories coming from Iraq. And, and that, was a key, that was a real problem, uh, because even when they said, you know, 
is he right or is he wrong? I'm still not getting this right. Whatever, oh, we'll come back to it. Or uh, it's lost. I in think the, one, in the one thing that I see is that after the congressional vote in uh, October, hmm. you had all this information from the UN, the inspectors, you know, the substance of what they were actually reporting or the substance of the actual debate was only covered in terms of when are we going to go to war after the congressional resolution. Right. Do you see kind of like a countdown towards war and only uh, not covering the substance of what was actually going on? Yeah, I think after after October 2002, after the this sort of debate in Congress, there really was this countdown towards the war. There really was this, uh, you know, how many days is it going to take uh, for Saddam to reply? Uh, and we're really, we're looking at the media, we're really looking at uh, the events in Iraq uh, as breaking news. And we're not most of them stepping back and saying, oh, let's begin to still challenge, or, or they were not stepping back and really saying, oh, let's begin to challenge those assumptions. Uh, there were a few, um, but the problem is in, in so many newsrooms, uh, and this is particularly true of television, but even true of print, is that there just aren't the resources there for much enterprise reporting, much investigative reporting. Uh, and it's the rare journalist who has you know, a decade or two or more of experience in this area who has uh, a deep list of sources to go to and who really has uh, not only the sources but has the, the sort of self-confidence to say, you know, this doesn't sound right to me. Um, and there really only were a few places that were doing any kind of challenging of the White House's uh, message at all. I see that there was some enterprising reporting, but the enterprising reporting had to do with when was the war going to start, and the war plans, the mobilizations, and can you speak to, did you see, you know, the patterns of, of what enterprising reporting was there? Well, there was, at some point the reporting on WME, at some point the reporting on WMD shifted. It shifted from a Washington story to an Iraq story and it shifted from the Washington bureaus at the State Department or the White House or the Pentagon to the bureaus in Iraq, bureaus in, in Baghdad or elsewhere. Um, and partly when that shift occurred, it shifted from a, a political story to a military story of, of when the war is going to start and are we going to get embedded and are we going to get embedded in the right places and that whole sort of tussle for turf uh, played out uh, and, and what it meant was that there was sort of this acceptance of the way the war or the potential war at that point was being played out and no, uh, there, was, there was an acceptance of the way the potential war was being sold and there was a sort of withdrawal from, from challenging uh, the assumptions of the war and just a sort of a, a, uh, an engagement with when's it going to happen? Um, who's going to be where? Um, you know, how many American dead are there going to be? Is it going to be finished just with um, air bombing? Are they going to use uh, the chemical weapons or the biological weapons or the nuclear weapons against us? You know, how much do we have to fear? And of course, the other question, the corollary question was, is there going to be a concomitant terrorist attack in the United States at the same time? Do we back in the United States need to fear too? And, and from your looking at all of this time period and afterwards, from your sense, why did the United States go to war with Iraq? The United States went to war with Iraq because the United States bought uh, what the president said. They brought the... They well, I mean, from the administration point of view, why did the administration go to war in Iraq? Well, the administration said they went to war uh, with Iraq because uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, uh, that he had used them before in 1988 against the Kurds, and was likely to strike again. He was not only a regional threat, but he was a global threat because his uh, regime uh, harbored terrorists and harbored terrorists including Al-Qaeda uh, who had been responsible for the 
So this really, it really was this sort of A plus B equals C uh, sort of logic to it. And you know what is what is tragic is that the media preeminently, or uh, what is tragic is the media bought that. The media didn't challenge that uh, linkage of Saddam Hussein with weapons of mass destruction. They belatedly came to challenge the linkage of Saddam Hussein with al-Qaeda. Uh, but they never really took on the question of, did Saddam Hussein have weapons of mass destruction? And even if so, how much of a threat were they uh, beyond the borders of Iraq itself? And so when you look at it in hindsight and all the evidence that's come out since about their justifications that they were selling to the American public, do you see that there are ulterior motives or, you know, is there, was that the real case? Did they really buy in? Did, did you sincerely believe that the administration believed all the justifications that they were using or was that just a pretext? Did the administration believe it? I mean, well, it, I don't have any insider knowledge, but it seems that all the books that have come out and all of the, the, the now belated uh, investigations suggest that the Bush administration had come in to the White House uh, wanting to go to war with Iraq, and effectively 9-11 uh, and WMD was a Trojan horse that allowed them to do that. Uh, I, I think the problem with the media was uh, I don't think there was conspiracy on the part of the media to, to back the president. Uh, I think what there was was still this honeymoon period post 9-11 where the media um, and much of the country, including the Democrats, were supporting the president uh, in whatever he felt was appropriate uh, to do in his so-called fight uh, against terrorism. Um, and that he chose to, to fight the war against terrorism in Iraq uh, rather than continue uh, a more aggressive assault against uh, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan or Northwest Pakistan, you know, that was seen as as you know his ba his bailiwick, um, and it was hard to get at the intelligence, you know, to know any differently uh, for the media. And if there are these reports out there that that was on their agenda when they first came in and then they use these reasons and those reasons fall apart. Is it the job of the media to try to, feel out, to figure out what those real reasons were back in 2001 or 2002? Well, there's only so much that I think the media could have done in 2002. I, I do think it was unknowable, uh, at least all evidence seems to point that it was, it was unknowable to know that Saddam Hussein effectively had no weapons of mass destruction at all. Uh, no effective chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. That was unknowable. But what was very possible was to uh, bring more sources into the dialogue, um, sources that would have challenged uh, some of the intelligence information that was coming out. Uh, what also was possible was just to challenge uh, what the president's agenda was in going into uh, into Iraq, you know, was it truly um, to fight terrorism, um, and particularly, you know, the terrorism as as headlined by Al Qaeda? Uh, was it truly because the Iraqi WMD posed such a grave threat, or was there really more of a political agenda? And I would argue that it, it may have not been noble in October of 2002, but by January. 27th, when Han Blix made his presentation, starts to crack a lot of, you know, gives some evidence that Saddam isn't fully cooperating, but at the same time, they're making progress. And then by March 7th, when Albarade comes out and says these aluminum tubes aren't, you know, for nuclear weapons, so there's no nuclear weapons program. And then, you know, but it seems like there's an Americanization of the issue. It's not really covered at all, the substance of any of this evidence. So it wasn't for people within, around the world, but also within the anti-war movement, was clearly saying, you know, you had Scott Ritter, there's no weapons of mass destruction, there's people out there saying this, and there's declassified documents from the CIA from the Gulf War Syndrome release that were saying that, that you know, that there was, there was questions about this. And it, so, I mean, it, don't you think that the, there was something that happened that the U.S. media was completely ignoring a lot of this evidence that was coming out 
There were stories in the U.S. media beginning in 2003 on what Hans Blix was saying, on what Mohammed al was saying and what others were saying, but they were buried. Um, particularly television um, didn't go to the UN, didn't go to the international organizations and say, you know, um, let's hear your side of the story. They really were putting uh, on and fronting just uh, the administration's side. That was, that was a really significant problem uh, because those other voices were saying, <laughs> You know, I don't think there are weapons of mass destruction here. Uh, and part of, the, part of the reasons I think the media, uh, part of the reasons I think the U.S. media didn't go to those international organizations is that it, it very much is a chauvinistic medium. Um, it prioritizes American voices. It prioritizes American policies. It prioritizes American diplomatic efforts. Uh, and the only time that you get sort of the international perspective is when, for example, in the case of France, when they are in direct opposition to, to the United States, and when it's, you know, you, you can kind of posit it as a, um, you know, the, the good guys, the United States are saying this, and the bad guys, France, are saying that. Uh, getting a sort of plethora of voices out there saying a plethora of things um, it's just not done um, for the most part, particularly in broadcasting. And so when you have a he said, she said style of objectivity and the Democrats and Republicans agree, can the press fill that void? One would like to think that when you have uh, a, one would like to think that when you have uh, a unanimity of opinion between the Democrats and Republicans, as we saw in the, in the build-up to the war, that even so the, the press, the media, could step in and say, uh, you know, I think there are other, other voices out there, other perspectives. There's an anti-war movement. Uh, there are international organizations. There's um, international uh, voices of other kinds that are speaking out. They should be able to put those, put those up front, uh, and not just on the editorial pages or in columns, but on the front pages, uh, at the top of the news, uh, on television, on, on radio, and, and that just wasn't happening. And do you, so do you pin a lot of the blame on more the editors than the reporters then leading up to the war in Iraq? And, and was there sort of a, a pack mentality, a conformity, or you know, is there a sense that you can't go too far out above like what everyone else is saying? Yeah. I think in covering weapons of mass destruction and covering the buildup to Iraq, there's the same problem that you always have in uh, the media's coverage of international affairs, which is the reporters in the field often get it right because, after all, they're in the field. You know, they're talking to people. The p reporters in Iraq or in uh, the Middle East, uh, they were, were trying to get stories uh, in play, and a lot of them were being ignored by. The, the home office or the, 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 the newsrooms back in New York and Washington. It really was, in many ways, the editors and the producers who were the obstructionist ones, uh, who were deciding that, oh no, this is not a front page piece. This is a, you know, a back of the book. This is a inside the news piece, or not a piece at all. Um, there, you know, there were challenges. Uh, but they just, they, you know, they never surfaced in any, uh, in any prominent way. And are they trying to uh, maintain friendly relationships with their, their access or their sources? Are they trying to uh, be more sensational, profitable? Uh, or what are some of the other factors, do you think, why, why these editors were making these types of decisions? Well, sometimes reporters pull their punches because they, they want to keep in with a particular source, whether the source is the White House or whether the source is an intelligence source. Uh, and so they may not be as critical as they might otherwise be. Uh, sometimes their sources are, you know, downright wrong, as we saw um, with Ahmed Chalabi, for example. Uh, and, but I think that although there was a lot of sourcing problems and, and some pulling of punches uh, by reporters that the more uh, 
egregious problem in the media coverage really was how editors construed the story. Uh, because if you looked at the editorial pages, uh, whether it's the New York Times or the LA Times, or you were listening to what was going on in the, in the, in the newsrooms at ABC or NBC or CBS or Fox or CNN, what was being said in those sort of editorial meetings or the editorial pages was uh, the president's right. Uh, and the caveats that were being expressed by the editors and the, and the publishers and the producers were, uh, we shouldn't go it alone, was more, you know, let's get um, the international uh, consortium behind us as we did with Gulf War I. Uh, let's not go it alone as sort of the lone cowboys. That was their hesitation. Um, and so they were receptive to critical stories of the president uh, in terms of the, the sort of Lone Ranger uh, type of um, issue. But they were less receptive to the stories that challenged that, that master narrative uh, that Saddam Hussein has opened some mass destruction, Saddam Hussein uh, is connected to Al-Qaeda and so on. And do you see a difference between how the uh, foreign press, United Kingdom press, covered this issue versus the uh, United States press during you know, this time period building up to the war in Iraq? Yeah, the, 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 the British media covered this quite differently, even though you know, Tony Blair, the prime minister, was you know, our preeminent ally in all this. Uh, the British press really was much more critical going into the war. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. One was there, were, there was some outspoken opposition uh, in Parliament uh, that allowed the British press to have the he said, she said kind of dialogue that uh, the lack of democratic opposition in this, the Senate and House really wasn't allowing the media in the United States to do. But part of it also was just a different type of media. Um, uh, here in the United States, we sort of value this notion of, of objectivity and separating out news pages from editorial pages. And of course, even though there, there's no way of, of not having some kind of spin in news coverage, there still is this idea that news stories in the United States should be sort of just the facts, ma'am, um, should lead with what we call in, in the newsroom sort of an inverted pyramid of the who, what, where, when, uh, you know, what happened. Um, and analysis, if it, if it comes, uh, you know, comes in a separate story that's labeled news analysis. In England, they're all conflated. Um, not only on the opinion pages and the editorial pages do you get, you know, ranting and railing about uh, uh, the government's policies, but you get that in the news stories as well. And not only in the news stories of tabloids, but in the news stories of uh, the Times, or the Guardian, or the Telegraph, or the Independent. Uh, so uh, there really was uh, a greater use of sources by the, the British press. They listened more to the anti-war movement over there. Uh, the, the, the political opposition um, was able to um, get more coverage. And so the British went into the war, I think, with some more knowledge than the Americans did. And do you see that you know, the, the beat reporting here is not asking the, the, the why or answering the why question or, or drawing conclusions as to why things are happening versus, and that's seen as an analysis piece, so it's, it's separate. Do you see that, you know, can you come to conclusions and adjudicate the facts and still be objective? Can you just say, this person's right and this person's wrong because here, I've looked into it a little bit and here's some facts. For, for, a, for a long time, for a long time, there's been uh, a debate within the journalism profession about whether uh, journalists can be advocates. And you have someone like Christian Amanpour who during the Bosnian War said, well, of course I have an opinion. You know, I, I've looked at this war. I've looked at the Serbs and the, um, and the Muslims and said, OK, uh, yeah, there's, there's no perfect side, but one side is doing more harm than the other. Um, so I'm, I'm casting my ballot, and I'm, I'm calling things as I see them, which is not just representing the facts, but is telling you who I think is bad. 
And a lot of those uh, sort of journalists who take that stand say, well, you know, they give you the example of Nazi Germany. You know, if you were a German, uh, they give you a, a lot of those journalists who take the sort of the advocacy uh, role on uh, give you the example of Nazi Germany. If you were a journalist in the 1930s or in the 1940s, would you not uh, call Hitler uh, the, you know, the criminal he was? Uh, or would you just stand back and say, well, Hitler says this, and FDR says this, and Churchill says that? Uh, but there's another sort of breed of journalists who say, no, that's, that's inappropriate. You don't do that. Um, and, and certainly editors, particularly at some of the, um, the major news outlets, uh, try not to um, sort of analyze the news or um, the issues or the speakers. Um, they try to, you know, sort of just give the facts, ma'am. Uh, what happens, though, is needless to say, they're, they're listening to someone. Um, and usually what happens is they're listening to the administration. One of the things that's very interesting is on smaller stories, stories that, that, aren't, that don't get a sort of a critical mass of coverage, you're much more likely in the newspapers and on television when they make television to get news analysis mixed together. Partly because there's, there's no uh, obvious political agenda that the administration has articulated. And so in some ways, because you're only having a one-off story, it frees the media up to call it like they see it. But when there's coverage of the big story, and the big story, um, the, the president has taken a, a political position on the big story, then everybody gets, you know, really um, skittish about challenging um, that uh, received message. And you get this uh, sort of church and state attempts at um, uh, separating out uh, news from opinion or news from analysis. But what, what if there's a case where you can clearly show when he said is wrong and that the, the facts show that they're wrong? Isn't it the job of journalists to say they're saying this, but it's flatly wrong, especially in an age of public relations? It's absolutely the, the job of, of journalists to call anyone out, the president, whomever it might be, uh, when they perceive the president is saying something wrong. Um, when they perceive the president saying something wrong, they should be called on it. What happened during Iraq, uh, or in the build-up to Iraq, was the president would say something was wrong, but it would still be the headline. Um, president says uh, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. And maybe uh, later in the article, or deep into the news story on television, there would be the caveat. You know, other observers believe that and they would say something that would be opposed to that. But they would still have the headline and the lead that would lead with the president's remarks. And in the sort of the journalistic uh, canon, it's accepted, in the American journalistic canon at least, it's accepted that if at some point you give the opposition that it's okay to um, start with the most important speaker and what the most important speaker has said, even though that may be wrong. Um, I mean, a lot of the problems, a lot of the problems with Iraq came because, a lot of the problems with the Iraq coverage came because the media adhered to this classic inverted pyramid, uh, uh, what do you call it, style. A lot of the prob a lot of the problems with Iraq occurred a lot of the problems of the Iraq coverage occurred because the media adhered to a classic inverted pyramid style, where they prioritized uh, what the most important person was saying. And what the most important person was saying was Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. And perhaps later in the story, 
They would come back to you and say, well, there are some people who may challenge that. Um, but they still led with that uh, false ass assertion um, by the president. And what the media didn't take responsibility for uh, until now is that by disseminating the president's uh, messages, by leading with the president's statements, that they were effectively disseminating um, the president's arguments as well, and they were making his case for him. They were effectively a megaphone for the president. Um, there should have been equally prominent uh, challenges to what he was saying. And uh, when you look at the issue of international law, you can go to international legal scholars and they would be able to say, well, in fact, you need a second resolution, or in fact, regime change is actually illegal in international law. And these are things that the administration was saying that were completely, even to this day, still going unchallenged. So when you look at issues of international law and the legitimacy of this war, um, that's just not something that's not on the radar screen of any journalist that I've really talked to. So why is international law, is that completely being ignored in, in this kind of debate? Yeah, international law was very poorly brought into the argument, and part of it was because the administration itself had marginalized uh, the role that international law should play. Uh, part of it was that you have uh, a Republican uh, element that uh, is very uncomfortable, to say the least, uh, we, you know, with the UN or any international uh, engagement in what they consider to be American domestic politics or national security issues. So that was part of the problem. But another part of the problem was because Iraq was covered as a breaking news story, it was covered as a political story, um, and WMD was covered as a political story, um, that uh, that was what led the news. Um, there never really was, I mean the problem with problem always with the big stories, the, and the, particularly the problem with big stories when you're talking about American troops and or even Americans on the home front being at risk, is that you never really have the second day stories. Uh, the president every day was out there, or Cheney, or Rumsfeld, or Powell, or, or uh, Rice, was out there every day with a new message. They dominated the news cycle. Uh, they never really allowed uh, opposition voices uh, to sort of get a word in. Um, and it was very skillful maneuvering on their part. And so how does a, a media that in some ways doesn't even recognize that this was happening, you know, how, how can they attack big ideas? And how can they cover ideas such as, is this war, does it even make sense? What's going to happen afterwards? You know, how, in the, for the future, you know, does there need to be a beat where people are looking at Know, these types of things, or how do you incorporate uh, big questions and ideas that are not events? Well, of course, the problem was the media does know all this stuff. The media does know how it should cover stories. It knows that it should put more sources up front. It knows it should it should challenge the president's message. It knows it should um, go to scientists and. Uh, the military, and not just listen to the Pentagon, or not just li listen to the Department of Defense, for example, um, on weapons of mass destruction story, but it forgot, you know, or it got seduced by terrorism, you know, it got seduced by the potential risks. I mean, you remember, you know, the anthrax story. Um, and how uh, newsrooms were targeted. When terrorism comes home to journalists, and not just the journalists who are out in the field who sort of expect uh, personal threats, but when it comes home to the newsrooms in Washington and New York, uh, you find those newsrooms a whole lot more willing to accept uh, the president's agenda for dealing with uh, the war on terrorism. And so what you, what you saw here was really a buying into uh, the president's logic uh, and, and therefore uh, 
a lack of, of recognition that they were even keeping their hands off. Um, although, you know, in the study that I looked at, you could see that at the same moment that they were you know, not challenging the president's assumptions or the intelligence on Iraq, they were challenging the president's assumptions and the intelligence on North Korea. You know, what was the difference? Well, the difference was, while there was some talk about potential war with North Korea, there, that was really never at the top of the agenda. It was really never an issue um, or, or a preeminent issue. Iraq was. Um, and so that was the difference. Do you see economics of the situation playing any factor into that as well? I, I think the economics of the media business have really made a difference. Uh, two kinds of economics. One is the media mergers over the course of the 1980s means that there's a lot fewer voices out there. Uh, and with fewer voices out there, you just don't get you know, the sort of the diversity of opinion that, that you might have gotten you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, although I should say that some of the best reporting came out of, of Knight Ritter, uh, which has papers and news outlets around the country. So th that argument to some degree only goes so far in the specific instance of Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. But there's another economic argument at play here too, and that's the, uh, there's another economic argument at play here too, and that's the 24-7, uh, I've got to keep my viewers, I've got to keep my subscribers' attention going. I can't let them hit the remote. Um, I can't let them, you know, choose another alternative news source. And so they led with the risk. They led with the apocalyptic threats. Um, they led with the scare tactics that were coming out of the White House. Um, they went to the experts in the newsrooms who were willing to um, back up the administration claims. Uh, you didn't hear, uh, you know, the anti-war protesters. Um, uh, because they, they were challenging, you know, well, let's not go to war. Maybe things aren't as bad as we think. Um, okay, and let me just see if there's anything else here. Um, you mentioned a little bit, uh, you know, the, the language uh, used to frame the debate, hmm. sensationalize and minimize. Can you talk a little bit about that? One of the things that I think was very interesting about how the weapons of mass destruction debate played out was the language used to talk about it. Um, the UN has a term called blue speak, which is the, the word it uses for its, its jargon, you know, talking about peacekeepers, for example. Um, there's no spies in the UN, you know, there are uh, sort of intelligence gatherers. There's no um, divisions uh, or battalions, there are units and so on. Well, we had, in the United States, we had a kind of blue speak, a kind of euphemisms that were used, um, uh, for example, uh, during the, the build-up to Iraq in 2002 and 2003, there was uh, at the same time, an internal debate uh, in Congress about uh, putting more money into R&D for uh, American nuclear weapons. And American nuclear weapons, for example, during that debate, as enunciated by Congress or enunciated by the White House, were always talked about as deterrence. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, looking at nuclear weapons overseas, particularly Iraq or Iran or uh, in North Korea, you know, the, the, the evil states. Uh, they were always uh, talked about as offensive weapons. Um, Israel's nuclear armaments, too, were also talked about as deterrents. Uh, so you had this, this, this use of language to frame, you know, are these weapons of mass destruction? In other words, you know, drum roll please, we need, uh, we need, to, we need to worry. Um, these are weapons to fear. Or uh, do we really have, uh, you know, nuclear deterrence to keep us safe in case some bad guys come over and threaten us? Uh, in which case, you know, um, things are okay, and this is what we need to do. Um, there are other kinds of, of language. Uh, 
I'm trying to think of other language questions. I'm blanking. I'm just writing. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, what do I want to say about those, though? Um, the mini nukes and the bunker busters. Um, when the administration was talking when the administration and uh, congressional leaders were talking about uh, the American uh, armaments, uh, very often they, they talked about them in, in very cozy terms. Uh, they talked about bunker busters and mini nukes, which you know, almost sounds like something from an Austin Powers movie. Uh, something clearly that has uh, a very limited function and that you know, almost seems fresh. And yet, those kinds of distinctions about uh, scale and size and power of nuclear weaponry were typically not discussed when talking about uh, the nuclear weapons programs of other countries. Uh, there always was more of a uh, sort of a doomsday uh, language that was used in reference to uh, Iraqi weapons of